happy hands, make some noise. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have been, I'm waiting, thank you. So for our math teachers, our ELA teachers, our science teachers, our, our foreign language teachers, our health teachers that are here, in social studies, we have been talking about uh, Eastern civilization, and new creations, and, and archeology span has been a major, major part of our discussions, looking at artifacts and fossils, so on and so forth. Uh, and just trying to make some connections, so bridge the gap between the past and the present, to help us understand how we do what we do today, how we know what we know today. Anybody remember Oxy? Who remembers Oxy? Yeah, 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 that was major. Okay, we'll talk about it later. So, while we were teaching, one day I'm like, yo, I know someone who's actually done this. So let's see if we can get him, and everybody knows me, I'm, I pick up the phone in the middle of class, I made the phone call because I got a connect. I call my connect, he's got another connect, and they're like, he would love to come. And I'm like, are you serious? And I started having all palpitations and everything. This man is awesome, I had an opportunity to bask in his greatness, he and his lovely wife. So I'm going to be quiet, I'm going to introduce um, Ms. Constance Diggs. Can you dig it? All right. Thank you for the three people that asked me. Um, and she will introduce our illustrious guest. Can you please give a round of applause to Ms. Diggs? Thank you. Hundreds of news outlets 
That cannot be beyond all of that is a, a wonderful father and grandfather, and he's here today because you're the next generation of young people who will hopefully go on to college, and who knows, one of you may be leading a thing somewhere. So without further ado, I'm gonna move out of the way. He's also a pretty cool dude, you guys. I've been working with him for about six years now. So here we go, Dr. R. Stephen I. Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. Bethsaida is the home village of the three fishermen, Peter, Andrew and Philip, who became the disciples of Jesus. Until recently, the location of Bethsaida was believed to be on a hill, about two kilometers from the shore of the Galilee Lake. It is a famous tourist site that's been around for over 30 years. If you've been to Israel, then most likely you've been here. But this location poses a major problem. Bethsaida was a fishing village. What is it doing a mile away from the shore today? To address this problem, a few theories were brought forth. Tectonic rifting that uplifted the village, sedimentation, or that the water level of the Galilee Lake was much higher 2,000 years ago than it is today. However, these theories did not sit well with the dissenters, who suggested the real location of Bethsaida to be much closer to the lake. Unfortunately, they lacked archaeological evidence to back this theory up. Until 2017. When archaeologist Dr. Mordecai Aviam and historian Dr. Stephen Notley discovered a Roman bathhouse on the present-day shoreline. This was a significant discovery, proving that the water level 2,000 years ago was the same as it is in our time. So a good friend of ours was able to get us a permission to come and film the ongoing archaeological dig of what may be the true ancient Bethsaida. So we were just stopped by a uh, by a truck that told us to keep following them because there are mines on the left and the right side of the road and they're working on removing them. So I said just to follow them, not to steer away from the road left or right until we get to the excavation site. It's hilarious about the Mokashim. How would Ethan know that? The sign says we can't drive here, they're doing excavations, so we'll just park right here and walk. 
Uh, we're here at the excavation dig for Bethsaida. It's very nice to meet you, Professor Notley. Yes. Is correct? Yes. Okay, so the theory was before that there were two sites, maybe sometime third or fourth century, I heard they, you know, they, they, because the water was higher, there's this theory, and then they had to move to a newer location. What do you think about that? No, that's, that, that at Tal, not only are they farther in than three kilometers, but they're much higher. And so one of their suggestions was that the lake was much higher than it uh, than it currently is and that most people assume they actually uh, they suggested up to three four meters higher than the the current lake level uh, that causes a number of problems every known settlement around the lake Capernaum Tiberias Magdala would be underwater uh, more than that last summer uh, in this probe we actually dug down and came to a Roman bath and the the level of it was actually lower than, not only lower than the folks at Etel assumed, but the lower than everyone assumed the lake level. These are actually very good news for us, because in the recent years, a lot of people are quite worried about the dangerously low water level of the Galilee Lake. And rightfully so, because it is our main source of drinking water. And the assumption that it drops a meter and a half every century is quite worrisome. So finding out that the level hasn't changed in 2,000 years is very appeasing. We have Roman we have settlement here in the Roman period. Um, means that we're between the lake and the other site. And if you're going to talk about a fishing village, this is. This is where you're going to assume that it's, it's located. It's, everything about it makes it the leading candidate of being uh, Bethsaida Julius. How do you date when you excavate those layers? How do you know which layer belongs to what? Just the pottery? Do you do carbon dating? How does it work? Don't do carbon dating. Carbon dating only works on, on materials that are alive, so pottery, things like that, you can't use. Generally, you use coins. You want to find coins that are uh, in, in C2, in place, that will date like on floors, next to walls, so you can date those and you slowly, slowly, as you go down, you keeping records of everything. It's very interesting to find it an important in the excavation, because then you can date the whole surface, the whole layer, and that's what's so important for us. We're trying to stop time. When you get a coin, while digging, it's more worth than just a coin that you find or buy from somebody. Yeah, because yeah. then you understand what time it came from, that layer right. of that right. earth, so that's yeah, a dig. Yeah. The coin for itself is important for what it was fine. What, what, it can, what can it tell us about context? Hmm. Can it date the context as it's got a year or a season uh, that we know of written on it? We we'll get it in the laboratory and it has a date and it was found right beneath the floor, sealed beneath the floor. Then it dates the construction of that floor. Mm. So this is very important. This is the best place you would imagine finding a coin. Yeah, I say this is 580. So the wall couldn't have been constructed before 580 or whatever that date might be. How would you know that? Just from the size of it? or Size, material, yes, yes. It's mainly chemical procedure with some physical, very delicate under the microscope in the laboratory, the specialist to do that. And then there's another specialist to date them. Mm -hmm. uh, more than 20 years, all over Israel, I especially uh, did the biblical archaeology. This is cl classical archaeology. Mm -hmm. We call it in mean, Old Testament. Mm -hmm. We call it the Jews. We yes. call it the uh, Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean the Bible. You know the story of Joshua, yeah. and the prophets, mm -hmm. and so on. So I made a very big research in the Jordan Valley, mm -hmm. in the Israeli side, trying to understand the story of the Bible. Mm -hmm. whether it's correct or just a fairy tale. Yeah. And I think it's correct. Wow. <laughs> and this is exactly why we are so interested in archaeology. All of the findings illuminate the stories written in the Bible and confirm them. No wonder the 19th century French theologian and explorer 
Ernest Renan called the Galilean landscape the fifth gospel. Look, I think that you have, especially when you talk about uh, like Christian tourism uh-huh. in the land, you, you you have the traditions that have developed uh, primarily in like the Catholic and the Orthodox churches, where oftentimes it was about remembering the site or the event, not necessarily saying that X marks the spot. It's just remembering the event or something like this. And a lot of Christian tourism, even for Protestant tours that come here, uh, still go to those sites. People want to see where does X actually, you know, happen. Um, I think this is what makes it very interesting. Yeah, because when we were reading, you know, it was like Jesus was taking the um, uh, the man and you know healing him around the side of the blind man. Right. And you're reading, and the and he saw trees, a uh, man walking like trees. And, you're, and in my mind, I'm trying to envision this. Where would it happen? Was right. it on a lake? Was it somewhere in the mountains? But now, when you actually read this, you can envision where it took place closer yeah. by the shore. Right. So, the, so what would the water be? Because it's kind of far right now. The water is uh, more or less about a half a kilometer, a kilometer away. But this this ledge that you see here, that more or less is the water line. So, I mean, this was a site that was right on the water. <laughs> In fact, just 20 years ago, the shoreline came all the way up here to the Bethsaida site. אנשים שחופרים מוציאים את האדמה מהאתר שלהם, זה מגיע הנה, כאן אנחנו מסננים ומחפשים גודיס. כמו מטבעות, זכוכיות, סרמיק. זו זכוכית, אבל זה לא אינדיקטיבי. ואת מה שמוצאים שמים פה בתוך הבלי, אחרי זה, פה אני עוד מעט אשים טג, שאנחנו נדע שזה מפה, שלא נתבלבל, ואחר כך בערב שוטפים את זה, הנה זו ידי של כלי. Um, the feeding of the 5,000 and Luke's gospel and the plains here, it, it, it uses a term, it speaks of the wilderness or the, uh, in, in Greek it's eremos, in Hebrew midbar, it's not, de- sometimes our English translations translate it as desert, we don't have deserts up here. So if you read your Bible and get to the place where it says, Jesus went to a solitary, deserted place in Galilee. Imagine this shoreline and its nearby hills where there are no settlements, but only nature. Thursday, yeah. So they think they found something huge in there. He could feel the vibration from the handle. Uh, that there's a big metal piece in there. Okay. The repulse is very oh, it has strong. It has vibration or something? Yeah. Oh, um, okay. They're gonna lift up the rocks under the floor and gonna find out what it is. It's exciting. Is this also? Yeah. Maybe a box of treasure. Right here. Where's the end? This needs, needs a bag. Come on. Right. Hey. Hey, Daniel. That's it? Matbea <laughs> in. Coin? Vindication after all this work? Yes! <laughs> we, yes we have a few of these coins above the Thank you, yeah. That's an M, yeah. Coin. Yay, Tim. Money under the floor! Yes. <laughs> Finally! Ah! Look, you found your the camera. Yeah. Wow. Wow. See the purple here? See the edge? It's incredible! It's incredible! There's a lot of information and some of the way of not Some of the parts of it I'll repeat. Mainly what I want to talk about here is how archaeology moves forward, uh, how archaeology takes place, and use some uh, slides, use our own dig as an explanation. Uh, usually, let's see if this switch.
switch out to the PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, we have to, uh, usually at the center of an excavation is a question. Um, there's a question you're trying to answer. Maybe it's uh, where a particular site is located or events that are reported about a particular site. And so archaeologists will come in in a very controlled, scientific way and try to answer those questions. Uh, the question that we are addressing is the lost city. Now this, for most people, when they hear us talking about uh, a lost city uh, being found, they, they, you know, especially if they if they've traveled to the Holy Land and into Israel, uh, they remark, you know, they drive all around, they get on and off the bus, they see a sign in front of a place that they visit, and they assume that those sites have always been known. That's that's actually not correct. Almost all of the cities in the Bible uh, get lost in time. Uh, some don't, some have continuous living there, but most places uh, are abandoned, Sometimes there's wars, they get destroyed, they get buried, they get forgotten. So for almost all of our sites, uh, we didn't know where they were 150 years ago. And with travel, ships and travel becoming much easier in the 19th century, we started having explorers come out from Europe, from uh, North America, coming over and rediscovering these places. So uh, a lot of times, if they, if you look here on Megiddo, it sort of looks like a uh, an oval there, it's actually a mound. Uh, a lot of times the site will have, uh, it'll be a, a rounded mound, and it will be quite high. It will be a series of layers of civilization living there. Megiddo, for instance, is uh, 27 layers. 27 different people groups, civilizations, live there on that site. And so an archeologist will come and want to dig down through that site try to get to the level that interests them most. Uh, so again, I've just brought up here a, a variety of sites, uh, and, and again, just underscoring that until recently, until a century or so ago, we didn't know where any of those were. Uh, so again, our site, which is a, a site that's mentioned uh, not only in the New Testament, but it's also mentioned in Jewish writings, uh, in antiquity, uh, is a site called Bethsaida. And in, in the New Testament, it always refers to it on the other side, uh, on the eastern side. Um, and that helped us to sort of start gluing in to try to locate this place. Um, and uh, there were already, in the 19th century, there were suggestions as to where that site might be. One was put forward by a man named Edward Robinson, who was actually a New Yorker. Uh, he taught in New York, he was a professor. And he's the father of historical geography. He came out on horseback, rode through the country, uh, had, a, had a partner in terms of looking, and they partnered together to identify most of the sites, many of the sites that we know today. Uh, again, this is about the middle of the 19th century, 1850, something like that. Uh, so he came out and he identified a site which in Arabic is called Entel, and um, he uh, he, he, uh, he identified that site, but he wasn't, uh, not everybody was convinced. Uh, shortly, a few years later, another man came along, a German, who suggested another site uh, called uh, El Arraj, which is the site we're excavating. You can see the pictures down in the right hand corner, that's signs of our excavation. I think you're in the PowerPoint, actually, not the, the uh, from the way it's packed here. But it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. But the uh, Schumacher, the reason Schumacher raised another site, or raised the question another site, was the biggest problem was the distance from the lake. If you can look here, it's a little dark, but you can see the site here, uh, and it's quite a ways away from the water. That also was, was brought out in the video, which presented a certain problem, presented questions. So a lot of people have questioned the uh, that identification, even though it's been excavated for 30 years, it has a sign on it that says it's Bethsaida, uh, and again, tour groups go there. There were a number of us who had questions about it, because the name Bethsaida means the house of fishing, the place of fishing. If you're gonna have a fishing village, you're not gonna have a fishing village a mile and a half from the, from the water. You're 
going to have it right on the water. Uh, so that led to us starting to look at some other alternatives. Uh, we began in, uh, again, all of the ancient descriptions are being arrived by boats, people come by ship there. Uh, all the suggested it was right on the water. It's also Josephus, the Jewish historian's description uh, of Bethsaida, that it was a place on the lake. Uh, so again, in the, in the meantime, for the last 30 years, there's been an alternate site uh, called the Bethsaida Excavation Project. That's not us. Uh, it's another site, and they claimed it was there, again, about a mile and a half in. But it has a number of problems, not only its distance, but it doesn't fit the description of what the site looked like. Uh, so this led, about 10 years ago, to a number of articles back and forth, arguing, discussing uh, the, the issues. And basically, the other folks said, if you think it's someplace else, go dig it. So we did. Uh, in 2014, uh, we did a shovel survey. Um, a shovel survey is where you take uh, a square, you take uh, five yards, five meters, five yards by five yards square, and you dig down one shovel, it's not like that, uh, and you take the dirt that you, that you come up with your shovel, and you put it through a, a, a you sift it through a screen, and find out that the dirt will come down through the screen, and see what remains. If there's any uh, pottery, any coins, any glass, anything that can give you hints, evidence uh, of who might be living there. So uh, we did this excavation and uh, the shovel survey, and based on that, we felt confident to move forward in terms of our uh, actually excavating the site. Uh, we began doing that. Again, not only do you do the shovel survey, but when we excavate, we excavate in squares. Over the squares, we, we designate them, we number them, and we keep very accurate records about what we are uh, digging up. Again, this is a picture of me down in the square. Uh, I brought up a picture of some tools, so you can know sort of the kind of tools that we use. Uh, up here on the far left-hand corner is a trowel. Uh, we also use a pick. I don't have a picture of a pick here, but we have a pick, a large pick. But when we get to things that can break or very sensitive, we use a trowel, go very slowly, very carefully. Um, if we come up with anything, uh, you heard the Israeli woman, I don't know if you she was a Hebrew, so it's hard to follow her, but uh, Shoshi was telling us that if we get anything, we put it in a bucket. See the bucket here on the right? And it has a little tag. That's how we record everything. We record it in, in the place that it was found. Everything is documented. Everything is recorded so that when we go back, we can actually describe what, not only where it was found in the square, but at what level. We actually keep track of how deep it was found because the farther you go down, the earlier it is. The farther you get down, the earlier are, are the, the civilization that you're coming to. Because people are building on one on top of the other. So the ones on top are the newest ones, the most recent ones. So you want to keep track of where you find those. Again, you can see some other tools down here, brushes, uh, small little uh, picks, and, and buckets. Again, these are our primary tools that we're using on site, although you did see them using a metal detector. Uh, metal detectors are very are helpful if you're looking for coins. And, and again, as the video was talking about, coins are important for dating. We want to be able to know what period, what is the time that we're looking at? And so points are very helpful in that process. Okay. Um, again, this is our excavation. Um, this is the what we call area A. You can see it laid out in the squares. We also have two squares over here, area B. Ours is a fairly small excavation for now. Um, it's picking up speed. We're increasing the amount we're excavating. Uh, but these are two primary places. The archaeologists, uh, it's a little bit of guesswork as to where you dig. Uh, they will make a, a informed guess based on various factors as to where they think uh, it would be most useful. Uh, because it's very time consuming, the amount of time and effort it takes, so you want to make sure you dig in the right place. 
Um, again, this is a day of the dig. You can see what goes on. People are digging out uh, in the dirt, finding various things. Uh, the buckets of dirt we take and we uh, take those over to those who are sifting on the screen. Um, that tracks here. But there's my wife to the left, my daughter to the right, who happens to be an elementary school teacher. Uh, fifth grade is her grade she, she teaches, uh, but she's a fifth grade teacher in, in Pennsylvania. So then they they both have been with me for the last three years on the day. So this is our this how we spend our summer vacation uh, on the day. But this is the thing that we do uh, during the course of the day. We start very 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 early. We are up at 5 o'clock. We're on the way to the site at 5.30, and by 6 o'clock, we're digging. We're, because we dig from 6 o'clock in the morning until noon, because the temperature gets up over 100 degrees every day. It's hot, very hot, so you want to dig in the cool part of the day. Uh, so we dig in the morning, and by noon, we eat lunch, and we're done. Or at least we're done digging. Uh, the other thing that we do is we, in the afternoons, every afternoon at 4 o'clock, we wash the pottery. In other words, the little bits and pieces that we come up with, we wash them in order to reveal in case there's any inscriptions, anything that we might, that we might miss on those uh, pieces of pottery. So we'll wash the pottery, we let it dry for a day or two, and then the archaeologists will sit with us and they will read pottery. By reading pottery, that means they go through them, they sort them out, which ones are most valuable uh, in terms of information. Uh, not every piece of pottery can give you information, uh, but some can. Uh, they will tell us certain things about the, the area that we're excavating at that time. So we'll do that every day. We'll uh, go through, wash the pottery, set it back, and a couple days later we'll dry it and we'll get into a, a cycle of, of doing that, the reading the pottery. And I, I threw this in here just to help you understand why you can, uh, how you read pottery. And this is a, actually, I always use this example of people to, to think in terms of Coke containers, uh, Coca-Cola. If we go back and look at how the bottles were made in the 1900, then look how they change and they change and they change and they change so that if you find one, that fits that style, you may dig it up, but you'll know what year it was made. You can date it by the style of it. And I, I even go beyond that, because most of us don't drink out of the glass, we drink out of the can. I can remember a time when we used to pull the tabs off, and uh, pull the tabs completely off, and then we found out that they were harmful to dolphins. And so then they came the next step, we have the ones where you pull the tab back and it stays on the can. That's probably what you're more familiar with. But that, that style changes in time. So likewise, pottery. If we find a piece of pottery that, uh, that has a certain style to it, it will tell us what period we're excavating. And if we use pottery, we use points to try to, to figure out at, at what period we're excavating. Okay. Uh, in our particular site, we had a, uh, at the top, just as we started, we hit the Crusader period. Crusaders are about uh, 800 years ago, something like that, about 800 years ago, and we came upon a sugar factory. Uh, they came of sugar there on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, you can see, I don't know if it's visible here, but they found a number of bowls, a number of vessels uh, in this area in the sugar factory, again, dating from the Crusader period. Remember what I told you is that as you go down, you get to the earlier period. So we, our level has Crusader, Early Islamic, Byzantine, and Roman. And technically, uh, the Second Temple period of, of Jewish history and New Testament period fall within the Roman period in terms of classical archaeology. Okay. Uh, this, as we dug down, we, we encountered, again, vessels that match Byzantine style. Byzantine is about 4th century, 5th century uh, AD. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found here were these little cubes. These little cubes are called tessera. And they are, uh, anybody ever seen like a mosaic floor? Uh, these are the little cubes, stone cubes of a mosaic floor. However,
Uh, okay. They, uh, anyhow, the, uh, the, these are different because they're not stone. They're actually glass, and they're, they're gilded with gold. They're painted with gold, and probably came from a very ornate building, either a church or a synagogue. Uh, again, as we dug down, we found various structures. This sort of helps you to see the types of layers, the digging down, the various uh, periods that we encounter as we go. As we got sort of to the lowest layer, we found Roman period pottery, um, and which again helps us to know that in that period of time, in the first, second century, almost 2,000 years ago, people are living there. Probably the most remarkable thing was the finding of a Roman bath. A Roman bath is like a sauna uh, that existed in uh, first and second century and gave us evidence that this is uh, this was the site, very likely the site of uh, Bethsaida Julius. Okay. Uh, a coin found at that level, again, points are very important. A coin was found that was minted by, uh, under the rule of a Roman emperor, Caesar, named Nero, uh, in the 60s of the first century. So again, when you find a point like that, it helps to date the level that you're doing. Most of our team uh, comes from Nyack, although we have other stuff outside as well. These are our students uh, and, uh, and participants in the day. Uh, again, this is the team. This was the team. Uh, the team gets larger each year. This year we had uh, more than we had in previous years. And we continue to expand as we excavate. Okay. Um, I don't know if we... Are you going to be successful on the video? Hold on just a second. I want to say a couple of things. We have one more video. I want to say a couple of things about what you're, you're going to walk over here and look at these. Please don't touch them because they're very, they're very fragile. Um, but sort of going from my right to the left, or from your left to the right, just talk a little bit about what you have. You have a bell, a little bell from the Roman period. Uh, you have a stone, a stone bowl that dates, uh, it's over 2,000 years old. Um, you have a, a cup. This little cup, which is interesting, with two handles on it, is from the first century. Uh, it's a style of cup that, that were used by uh, Jewish residents living in, in the land of Israel in that period. You'll see, uh, what I find interesting are the lamps, the different style of lamps. Uh, this lamp here, with it looks like it's sort of squeezed at the end. Uh, that that is probably about 2,500 years ago, old, 2,500. It's right next to a lamp that is uh, from the Byzantine period, which is again about 1,500 years old. On down here, sitting not on a not on a stand, actually is a first century lamp called a Herodian style lamp which is from the New Testament period. And again, we have a couple of other little vessels here, uh, and I brought them as well. Uh, pottery handles that were uh, handles for pots. So you can get sort of the idea of the style of things that one finds when you're excavating. Again, these are quite small. We, we actually encounter large, large things. We dig up sometimes quite large objects. Uh, but these are small objects that I have personally. And uh, I'm going to close with a video, another video. This is shorter. Uh, hopefully the sound will and they, they apologize. As you know, when they're videoing this, it's an active excavation. So there's banging going on, there's things happening, so it, it uh, uh, just lets you know. So they, they actually uh, will signal you that there's going to be a big bang taking place. This actually, I just received this yesterday. Uh, so no one's seen this. It's not on the public web. Uh, so you're, you're seeing it first. Uh, but again, it's sort of updating what we're, what we're seeing on uh, what we're doing in our archaeological team.
Welcome to uh, El Araj, the excavations for concluding our third season here. Uh, this year we expanded our excavations, uh, not only in the number of participants here, we expanded to 40, which is twice as many as we had last year, but we also uh, doubled our time. Uh, we went from two weeks, which was the previous two years, each season we did two weeks, this year we've done four weeks. We've seen a considerable uh, widening of our efforts and also unearthing things from the past. The history of this site giving us more insight into uh, what this place was, who lived here, uh, extending from the Roman period right up through Byzantine, early Islamic, and the Crusader period. Um, we have some finds here. We're going to go through and talk a little bit about them and, and give some details. Um, these were really the center of attention here. Um, we found mosaics. Um, these are uh, bichrome, black and white mosaics belonging to the bathhouse uh, that were there uh, down below us uh, in this area. We had found a series of mosaics. Um, they were all, they had been broken, so they weren't uh, in situ, uh, but it gave us an indication together with uh, the tiles and the tubuli that we were looking at a, uh, a Roman bathhouse, uh, probably dating from the early to late Roman period. Again, there are a number of finds from there, um, from the, uh, the tiles that were discovered. This year we took them out and continued to penetrate on down even to the earlier sections uh, that are there in the bathhouse. Another element that was found in the excavations, uh, we found some last year and continuing more this year as well were uh, frescoes. Uh, frescoes are when the plaster is painted while it's still wet and the, uh, the paint, the color is absorbed into the plaster. Uh, these are Pompeian, red Pompeian uh, style, which gives us an indication of the wealth, opulence that existed. This is not uh, a mean house, but this is a house of someone with uh, economic means to have this. Uh, again, there have been a number of these found down in this location, in this square, down below here uh, in the Roman period. Here this season we made important achievement. We discovered that what we thought is a wall here, as a matter of fact, is a corner of a solid structure. I don't think uh, if it was found in another place, it would say maybe a tower of a wall, but I don't think this place was walled, although it's possible. Uh, it looks like a big massive uh, uh, pilaster of what could be, or a wall, of what could be a corner, of what could be a uh, bathhouse, according to the many, many uh, bricks uh, and tubuli and plaster and uh, mosaic and uh, uh, two pieces of uh, fresco um, plaster. Altogether, with no doubt, is for a bathhouse which is somewhere here. And that's something we should check when we'll dig the entire area to the Roman period. We got down deep below its foundation. There are still Roman pottery there. It shows us, the, it gives us the, the, the level or the connection between the level of the settlement and the level of the sea. And that will be studied also by our geologists. Anybody have a question? Uh, 
Okay, do I have a couple here? Yeah. Here and then right in front of you. There's one right by you as well. Okay, come on up, ask some questions. How many artifacts did you find in this tree? Very good. Uh, usually when we're digging, we'll find hundreds and hundreds. Uh, every summer, we'll find hundreds of pieces. I would say almost thousands. But not all of them are uh, of equal value. Some will tell us information, more information than others. We generally don't keep the pieces that we don't uh, aren't helpful, and every now and then we find something that's very remarkable, uh, and, and those we try to keep and set aside. I started it because I'm I'm actually a historian. Uh, I deal with ancient history, and one of the ways that we're able to tell history is through the what people leave behind. And so for me, I had some questions. And others had questions as well, and someone needed to jump in and push this forward to try to answer the questions. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're trying to ask the question, is this the site of this ancient city that's talked about? And if so, what was there? What was the container? Okay? All right, now we got a real Okay, go ahead. This year, our team, and this last summer, our team grew, and we had at least 40. Uh, they came for two weeks. People would dig for two weeks, and we had two two-week sessions, so that would be 80. But then, like, on the second week, the last week we were there, we had 30 Israeli students come for a week. So suddenly we went from 40 to 70, which was actually a bit of a stretch. So I, we probably had, in, at the end, probably totally the dug there, let's say between 100 and 120 people. How much um, places did you find? How many of those places did you find? Uh, this is my only one. This is the uh, only one that I'm involved in is this one. Uh, others are involved in digging at other places and looking. There's actually many excavations going on, not only in the Holy Land, but throughout the Near East, different parts of the world. There's archaeology in America. Uh, there are places that they're digging uh, here in America, looking at historical uh, artifacts that remain here. So it, this is something that happens all over the world. Excellent question. I thought you thought it was dangerous to me. No, you know what I mean? They, uh, it's actually, you have to be careful who you're in the square with because if they're swinging the big they can also get you, so that's something you have to watch. But good question. You, you did with the larger pick. Uh, sometimes accidents happen. Uh, but generally, you will know when you're getting to the point where there are things where you set aside the new, the, the big pig, and you start working with a very small, delicate pig and the trowel. That's always something that we're careful for, trying not to break glass, break pottery, or things that we have. What inspired you to start excavating? Okay. Uh, I, I got involved here again because I had a question. I, I, didn't, I didn't agree with somebody else who was digging at another site and the things that they were saying. And so basically it came down to uh, we had to have an alternate excavation, a different excavation, to sort of weigh the evidence out. So this is, um, this is what motivated me to get involved in this excavation. These are all very good questions, by the way. I guess you don't get such good questions for adults. Have you seen the bones? Uh, yeah, yes. We, we actually see quite a few bones. Uh, generally, they are bones of animals that have been eaten, you know, that they throw the bones aside, or fish, it's a lot of fish bones. 
and they'll actually live. I mean, the bones will, uh, they'll still be there after a couple thousand years. Um, and occasionally we find human bones as well. We have them on the site, we don't advertise it very much, uh, but we have found them because in this area, about 150, 200 years ago, it was an area of Bedouin, uh, who were nomadic people so in there, and they actually buried, they, there is a burial on, on certain parts of the property that we've actually come across uh, the remains of, uh, of human bones. So, yes. No, they're never scared, uh, not once. Uh, I find it interesting, exciting, and I think the biggest thing is the challenge of the physical labor. So, I'm not young anymore. If there, if there was a fishing area, wouldn't there be fishing supplies? Did you find any fishing, like boats, the fishing rods, any boats? Excellent question. That is a brilliant question. You want to come on the dig with me next summer? Because we actually, uh, the boats, the boats would have been disintegrated because the wood would have disappeared. They, they didn't use, no, no, I don't, and they didn't use, they didn't use fishing rods, they actually used nets. Uh, they, they used nets that gathered up the fish. So and those, by and large, are there. However, you're 100% correct. We have found a number of fishing hooks. We have found fishing hooks and also lead weights that would go on the nets because they, uh, I don't know if you know what a saying is, but. That's exactly correct. That is 100% correct. And so we have we have the lead weights that would hold the net down, and we also have hooks. They also used hooks at points as well. We have both of those, which are indicators that we do have a fishing boat. Oh, okay, excellent questions. Again, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to whoever. Thank you, Mr. Thorpe, for bringing us these experts so that we can enhance our learning. So please clap.